About 17 years ago, I was with the finalists, the fellow finalists and winners of the Ernst & Young EY Entrepreneur of the Year competition. The big competition for entrepreneurs to win. And amongst us, there was somebody who was a little older than all of us. In fact, she was 80 years old at the time. And I started talking to her. That person was Helen Taylor Thompson. And I can say without exaggeration that I was mesmerized and inspired from that first meeting. She told me about a charity that she was winning the award for, about Tare Machi, which in Indian language and Hindi translated to English means starfish. A charity, a project, a social enterprise that won her Social Entrepreneur of the Year. Providing educational videos about health, about hygiene, about AIDS, about HIV in Africa, in South Asia. DVDs being distributed that people would watch in villages in remote areas. And I was enveloped under Helen's wings. That was it. And from then on, she has been a constant inspiration. And from then on, she never stopped, never stopped the years I knew her until she sadly passed away. She was, of course, always assisted by her beloved husband, Derek, and remember, uh, on the way, driving from the House of Lords to KPMG for this lecture, I drove past Fishmonger's Hall. And I remember a few years ago, we had a wonderful Tare Machi event at Fishmonger's Hall. And I remember speaking at that event, I remember Towards the end of it, there was a panic because Derek had suddenly fallen ill and we were very worried. Fortunately, he was all right and recovered after that. The Helen Taylor Thompsons of this world, not one in a million, they're one in a billion. The people who are extraordinary. They're driven by a sort of clear sense of purpose with enormous passion. And that's infectious. An infection that creates devotees like me, like Stephen Clark, like Clive Doug Dixon. Devotees. Helping, helping make the world a better place helping the collaboration between business and social sectors. And that is the title of this lecture, Making the World a Better Place, Collaboration Between Business and the Social Sectors. This lecture is in memory of Helen Taylor Thompson, OBE, who sadly passed away in 2020, in the midst of the pandemic, age 96. And because of the pandemic, we were not able to attend her funeral. We had to watch it remotely. But I'm grateful that at least we were able to witness it remotely. The world has evolved over the past couple of decades from everyone becoming more aware, more aware of what started with uh, PPP, people, planet, profit, or purpose. Then it went on to CSR corporate social responsibility. And now, of course, we've got ESG, environmental, social, and governance. All this is about the business world now not just being about making profits, not just about increasing shareholder value, 
but about businesses having a purpose, businesses doing good, businesses being a force for good. And it's business and the social sector and the charitable sector all working together and contributing. Through ESG agendas, more and more business, they're having to demonstrate to stakeholders that they are actively pursuing environmental, social, and governance issues. They are having to do this, not just because it's the right thing to do, but everyone is now demanding businesses do this. And business and social sector partnerships, the importance of forging new and creative partnerships to achieve social goals, to help tackle our biggest challenges, the pandemic and the environment. Now, the pandemic is happened now. Nobody predicted it. it. came out of the blue. March 23rd, 2020 is a date that I will all remember, we'll all remember when we went into lockdown. Lockdown, this new concept that we didn't even know about, that never existed before that led to a global pandemic, which has quite frankly been the biggest crisis the world has experienced since the Second World War. It's affected everyone. It's been sad. Lives have been lost. Every one of us, sadly, has lost someone. And the climate crisis, a crisis that you can see staring us in the face for decades to come, that we've got to act on with urgency. Climate change, the environment, sustainability, biodiversity, COP26 coming up now next week is crucial. People talk about this new attitude in business as a sort of stakeholder attitude, stakeholder capitalism. I at Cobra Beer, my business that I founded three decades ago, I followed what is called the, what I call the partnership model. I don't think about customers, suppliers, shareholders, bankers. They're all part of the family. They're all partners, whether it's your customer, whether it's your supplier, whether it's your employee, whether it's your shareholder, whether it's your advertising agency, your banker, your lawyer, your accountant, they're all partners. And if you operate with a partnership model, I found it to be far more powerful, a uh, more powerful way of looking and operating. And today, here we are collaborating with KPMG, one of the most famous business brands in the world, one of the top advisors, professional services companies in the world. And this lecture is exclusively online, thanks to KPMG who are making their 21st Century Ignition Broadcast suite available for the event. So thank you very much to KPMG. Thank you to John and to Bina, uh, the Chief Executive and Chairman of KPMG, who are good friends of mine. Uh, and I declare my interest as a long-standing client of KPMG's. Um, the pandemic has brought out many words that we all now refer to in describing it. Of course, it's unprecedented. Then you come up with the word adapting. We've adapted. You come up with resilience, the remarkable resilience. You come up with compassion, the amazing compassion that has been shown during this pandemic. And the one word that comes up time and again is collaboration. Collaboration between government, business, the social sector, academia. And we've seen throughout this pandemic, government working on its own doesn't work. It's when it's collaboration that works. And the best example of that is the Prime Minister appointing Kate Bingham from the private sector to lead the vaccine task force in May 2020 and empowering her to just get on with it and enabling her. And that worked. And on the 8th of December, barely eight months later, we had the first vaccination and we had six vaccines on order. Wow, that could not have happened if government had operated on its own. It only happened because of government and business and universities. Oxford University collaborating with AstraZeneca, a British Swedish company headquartered in Cambridge as part of the Cambridge University cluster. It's very, very powerful. If you ask young people today, survey after survey shows that two things matter to them more than others. One, they really care about the environment 
about climate change, about sustainability, about biodiversity. It matters to them. And secondly, they really care about diversity and inclusion. And I speak to you today as the first ethnic minority president of the Confederation of British Industry, the CBI, the largest and most powerful and influential business organization in the UK, which KPMG are proud members. And I have launched an initiative exactly a year ago called Change the Race Ratio, which champions ethnic minority participation across all business. And in fact, I spoke about it in a debate in the House of Lords yesterday, and I'm sure Helen would be very proud of this initiative and would be my biggest champion. In fact, the pandemic and our environmental challenges in many ways out of adversity comes goodness, the world being a better place. Helen started her charity work in the 1980s when she was nearly 60 years old. You remember at that time the world faced the immense challenges of HIV and AIDS and the stigma of homophobia and Helen just didn't accept you won't last six months. She didn't accept that. She got on and she did something. She didn't even think of the concept of retiring. People like Helen never retire. She founded three charities, the Mild May Mission Hospital, Tari Machi Starfish, which has evolved to being named Education Saves Lives, and Can Mezzanine. She used her business experience to become a social entre entrepreneur. So here we are, COVID-19, pandemic, the 40 years of work that Helen did. What is the legacy going to be in the environment that we live? What is her inspiration? Can the business sector and the social sector work together to tackle the world's biggest problems? Can business be a force for good? Well, visionary leaders like Helen, they are people who make things happen. They are people who are the sort of people who can achieve things. And her charities, Education Saves Lives. To summarize, interactive lessons in health and life education. We create simple interactive audiovisual lessons, videos with presentations embedded about health and other topics to help people live more safely, literally saving lives. These are done in local languages. They're translated to communities so that all people everywhere in the world, whatever their level of education, can access information that they can understand. It's distributed free around the developing world. And these lessons uh, enable people to make their own choice, make, take more control over their lives, and as I said, literally saving lives. So far, just this year, 2021, and we haven't finished 2021 yet, 15,000 lessons have been distributed, and 3 million people will watch a lesson that can change or save their lives. So this year, the year after Helen passed away, her legacy lives on amazingly. Mild May Mission Hospital. Mild May has been at the forefront of HIV and AIDS care, treatment and rehabilitation since 1988, continually adapting and responding to meet new, often complex and rapidly changing needs. And this is delivered through the, the London-based hospital of Mild Bay in Shoreditch. It's delivered overseas in Kenya, in Uganda, where Mild Bay works with over 100,000 of the more vulnerable and hard to reach people living with and affected by HIV and related health and social issues. In 2021, Mami Hospital is now caring for people who are homeless or rough sleeping, as well as those with HIV and AIDS, as they have done for over 30 years. The Hospital London's primary facility for people who are homeless and recovering from COVID. So here again, 
the year that Helen passed away, her wonderful work carries on. And then we have the can mezzanine, soon to be canopy, a building, a 30 million pound hub for the social sector in the heart of London is the plan. A seven floor center with flexible office space and co-working, a cafe and exhibition space and a conference venue. And the aim of the center is to give the social sector an office space in London near Westminster in the city to foster collaboration with business, government, and within the social sector itself. I mean, absolutely amazing. And, and this came about in 1998. Well, if I, if I go back a little further, if I just backtrack. Helen was part of Churchill's secret army, the special operations executive, the elite, the SOE, during the Second World War. And then, after that, went on to run several businesses before getting involved in healthcare management in the voluntary sector. And during the 1980s, Helen negotiated a lease for Mild May Hospital from the then Health Secretary, Ken Clark, who's now joined me in the House of Lords, Lord Clark. And you know what he said to Helen? You won't last six months. As he handed her the keys for the lease for one pound. But Helen turned it into what was to become the largest AIDS hospice in Europe. And I've told you how it still operates so amazingly today. In 1998, together with Andrew, Lord Mawson, who joined the House of Lords around the same time as I did, and Adele Blakeborough, Helen founded a national network of social entrepreneurs aimed at using business to tackle social problems called the Community Action Network, now operating as Can Mezzanine, which I've just told you about. Just look at how all this has happened in, in the decades, in the decades leading up to now. And at the age of 76, Helen launched the digital learning platform designed to help prevent the world's poorest women from getting AIDS. And that is what became Education Saves Lives. And now it is in over 65 languages. And she pursued the objective of equipping the world's poor with knowledge right up to just before her death 20 years later. So just extraordinary what one individual can do. And these three initiatives of hers, as I've just told you, are still very much not just alive, but thriving based on her legacy. In 2018, Helen was included in the BBC's list of 100 influential and inspiring women from around the world. And in 2019, she was awarded an honorary doctorate from the University of Buckingham, where my friend Sir Anthony Selden was vice chancellor until just recently for her charitable work in the field of medicine, because they've started a medical school at Buckingham under Sir Anthony Selden's leadership. So Helen was an amazing role model. And if any way that we can extend the reach of her example, I think we would all be happy to do so. And it's been a privilege to know her and to work with her. I just look back at my own career building Cobra Beer, which is now, I'm proud to say, a household name. From scratch. You know, in India, they don't use the term SME. They use the term MSME, micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. MSME. In India, in India, they don't use the term SME. They say MSME, micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. And Cobra Beer started off as a micro business. There were just two of us, my partner, Arjun Reddy, and I. And we grew it into a small business, into a medium business. And now, for the last 12 years, we've had a global joint venture with Molson Coors, one of the largest 
brewers in the world, a multi-billion dollar New York Stock Exchange listed company. But from the very beginning, when there were just two of us with this unknown brand, nobody told me to do it. Nobody told us to do it. We started supporting charitable events by donating our beer free of charge to help the charities raise money. Whether it was providing beer to be served at a fundraising event, whether it was providing beer to be auctioned off to raise money, a very popular prize to this day is free Cobra beer for a year, a case a month delivered to your doorstep. And it grew, grew to supporting very big events. So for the past 14 years since its existence, we have been supporting the Lord Mayor's Curry Lunch in the Guild Hall, attended by thousands of people from the city. That has now raised over two million pounds for the Armed Forces Charities, and Cobra provides beer free every year for that event. At Macmillan's Cancer, the tug of war, the House is a Parliament tug of war. We have our tug of war every day with legislation, but this is a real tug of war with a series of matches ending with the House of Lords versus the House of Commons. Sponsored, Cobra Beer provides the beer for that, hundreds of people attending, and we raise, even in hard times, 150, 250,000 pounds net for Macmillan's cancer. And it's a state of mind, it's an attitude. The best definition of luck that I ever heard was in the Harvard Business School classroom. Luck is when determination meets opportunity. I had the privilege of chairing the Cambridge Judge Business School for five years, and one of our rock star professors, they call them in America, Mark Durand, defined the word serendipity as meaning seeing what everyone else sees, but thinking what no one else has thought. So if you have this attitude of mind, if you want to do good, and if you want to put back in the community instinctively, then you see these opportunities. You get lucky. Another example, I was giving a talk at Guy's Hospital, uh, King's College University, and one of the panelists was the chief executive of Blue Water, B-E-L-U Water. Look out for it. You'll see it more and more. And I was seeing it everywhere. I was seeing it as our water in Parliament. So why is this water suddenly taking over from all the other famous water brands? What's so special about this water? And I discovered during that presentation, the secret of Blue Water is it sold a premium water, the best of the best water, sold at the same competitive price to wholesalers that sell it to the restaurants, then sell it to consumers who all pay the normal price, make their normal profit. The big difference is Baloo itself donates 100% of its profits to water aid to save lives through sanitation and clean water. And I said to the chief executive, how many Indian restaurants do you supply? We supply 7,000. She said, none. I said, well, we'll, 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 we'll sell your water. We'll co-brand a Cobra Foundation Baloo water. Today, we have raised hundreds of thousands of pounds through selling Cobra Foundation Baloo water Nobody asked us to do that. Nobody forced me to do that. Nobody told me to do that. We make zero profit from it. 100% goes to save lives, to sanitation, and clean water. So it's that attitude, it's that attitude that somebody like Helen Taylor Thompson had instinctively after a successful, varied, amazing career going back to the Second World War to do all the amazing work she did for decades until she passed away at the age of 96 last year. So it's about having a mission. It's about having a vision. It's about attitude. And it's about purpose. Business with a purpose. People with a purpose. Business as a force for good. And you know the CBI, the Confederation of British Industry, we've seen during this pandemic that business's reputation has actually gone up. It's amazing. And you have to lead by example. I remember when the pandemic started, people didn't know what was going on. People didn't know what government help was available. People didn't know where to go. There was a lockdown. There was uncertainty. There was ambiguity in abundance. And yet the CBI would set up a hub immediately so people could immediately go and find out information, not just to our members, free to anyone, any business, anywhere in the country. We had webinars regularly, three, three webinars a week with experts, not just to our members, free to anyone. Thousands of people watch those webinars. We offered free membership, six months free membership, no obligation to actually stay on as a permanent member to anyone. Thousands of businesses took that up, and here's the good thing, 25% of them actually stayed on as permanent members. At Cobra Beer, our restaurateurs, their businesses were shut in the lockdown. They were really suffering. 
I would hold webinars and inform them, give them information, give them advice, helping at a time. And then Prince Charles's charity, the British Asian Trust, approached us, his charity for South Asia, and said, we want to do a big curry night in with Cobra Beer Help Out. I said, no, we will not help out for one night. We will do a big curry night for 10 nights in May 2020. Restaurants that were shut opened up and did takeaways. And we raised over 50,000 pounds in awareness and set up a website and all the technology, all in the midst of a pandemic, all working remotely. And we did that. And the restaurants were amazing. So all this is possible if you have the right attitude. At the CBI, in the midst of a pandemic, we have released our economic vision for the next decade called Seize the Moment. You know, it's in the midst of times of adversity that true leadership, my, my father, the late General Bellamoria, who commanded 350,000 of his troops as commander chiefs of the Central Army in India, said, son, the true test of leadership is not in the good times. The true test of leadership is in times of adversity. And it's times of adversity you can come up with great things that affect the future. Look at the beverage report in the middle of the Second World War, 1942. Nobody knew in 1942 when the war would end. And there was a beverage report that after the war was implemented, which led to the National Health Service, which led to the welfare state, which transformed this country. To this day, those reforms exist. So similarly, our seize the moment identifies 700 billion pounds of opportunity if we do certain things. And it's all identified and quantified. So one is decarbonization, innovation, global trade, thriving regions in the United Kingdom, beyond London and Oxford and Cambridge, leveling up, as the government calls it, clusters, promoting clusters, regional clusters, health, health of the nation, not just health as in hospital health, social care, mental well-being, and general well-being. And inclusivity and skills, education and diversity and inclusion. And before I conclude, I want to touch on another very important aspect. And that Helen Taylor Thompson, one of the reasons for her success is because people who met her instinctively, immediately, automatically trusted her. How do you engender trust? We were given a lecture during the pandemic, a virtual lecture by one of my Harvard Business School professors, Frances Fry, and she described trust as a triangle. To engender trust, one, you have to be authentic. And Helen was as authentic as they come. Is it the real you? Secondly, logic. Do you have the capability, the professional ability, to deliver what you're promising to do. And Helen had that in abundance. And the third thing you have to do to gain trust is empathy. Are you in it for yourself? Or are you in it for you, for them? And Helen was always in it for them, for you. So authenticity, logic, empathy, and you gain trust from whoever you deal with. So what's the future going to be? We've got to generate growth. We've got to generate jobs. That will generate the taxes. And that will pay for the public service. And that will pay down the debt. But business has to be appreciated as a force for good. Now, what made Helen achieve what she achieved? Fundamentally, she believed in what she was doing. It's that strong belief that can achieve miracles. It's like Mahatma Gandhi saying, my favorite saying of Mahatma Gandhi is your beliefs become your thoughts, your thoughts become your words, your words become your actions, your actions become your habits, your habits form your character, and your character determines your destiny. So it all starts with that belief. I go back to Harvard Business School when I went to my final lecture before we all became alumni. There was a lecture given by one of the most famous business school professors ever, who sadly passed away recently, Professor Clay Christensen. He came into the lecture hall. There were two sections, 200 of us. And he said, I'm really sorry. I'm apologizing. It's my first big lecture in a long time. I've been very ill. I've had cancer. Then I got a stroke. I've beaten the cancer. I've recovered from stroke. He said, my movements are fine, but it's affected my mind. Please, when I give this lecture, 
I find it difficult sometimes to say the words that I want to say. If that happens, shout out the words. It will save some time. We had to shout out the words many times. And at the end of the lecture, he was in tears and we were in tears. The message of his lecture was very simple. I wish I'd heard that lecture earlier in my life. He said, have you stopped and thought, every one of you, what is the purpose of your life? And linked to that, how will you measure your life? And I say that the purpose of Helen's life was to serve. She was a true service leader. You know, Sandhurst, the motto of the British Army, is serve to lead. The Indian Military Academy my father was commissioned from, if I paraphrase it, the safety and welfare of your country comes first always and every time. The safety and welfare of the troops you command comes second always and every time. Your own safety and welfare comes last always and every time. She was a magnanimous leader. She smiled. She brought a smile to your face. She was kind. She was generous. And I remember when I went as a fellow of Sydney Sussex College, Cambridge, after Nelson Mandela passed away to convey the college's condolences to Archbishop Desmond Tutu, a fellow fellow at Sydney Sussex College, Cambridge. And I met him, and we were chatting. We had breakfast together after a service. At, and I said, what was so great about Nelson Mandela? He said he was a magnanimous leader. Helen was a magnanimous leader. Our motto at Cobra Beer is to aspire and achieve against all odds with integrity. That is almost a definition of entrepreneurship, coming up with an idea, wanting to get some of the idea, having all the odds stacked against you, and going out there and making it happen, and doing it the right way with integrity. That is what Helen did. She was a true entrepreneur. And you know when you aspire and you achieve, you inspire. And that inspiration creates aspiration. And that aspiration creates achievement. And it becomes a virtuous circle. A virtuous circle that we, we, are now all enveloped in. Helen Taylor Thompson's virtuous circle of aspiration. Helen, your long life, your great work, your legacy, your inspiration will live on forever. Helen Taylor Thompson, not one in a million, one in a billion. Thank you. <laughs>